right, so welcome everybody. This is Nova Scribes for September 3rd, 2020. And we are about to do sketch noting side by side with Mike Rohde. Let me just, I, he doesn't need an introduction. I still got to introduce him anyway. So I, I met Mike Rohde in 2012 at the IFVP in Pittsburgh, okay? I'd never heard of sketch noting before. I'd been doing graphic facilitation, graphic recording. And he's like, you can do this small. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so amazing, right? Um, so he has two books out. There's the Sketchnote workbook and then the Sketchnote handbook. Just check this out. Mine is so worn that I had to take it to FedEx and have them spiral bind it because I had broken the cover so much, right? It's this wow. and Sam Kaner's book and that's it. You know, and that's the only ones I've had to spiral bound. But here's the thing about Mike that always impressed me. He chose not to trademark, restrict, or copyright the term sketchnote. His goal was to get it out there. So practicing one of Nova Scribes' values of abundance, that just, that really spoke to me. Um, and it was when we were putting Nova Scribes together, it was like, you know what? We're going to take a page from Mike's book. We're just going to get the information out there. So in a lot of ways, he influenced the DNA of what Nova Scribes is and what it's supposed to be. Okay. So thank you so much, Mike, for being here. I'm super excited. I'll shut up and let you take over. Well, thank you, guys. You can see uh, the background in this view is uh, beautiful Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I live. Uh, it's not night yet, but I like that shot. So <laughs> that's the one I used. I'm going to switch over to um, the full view. So you should be able to seeing my sketchbook here. And then I'm off to the right. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through. So one of the things uh, when I do workshops like this, because I never know who's going to be in the workshop. And so I always try to be considerate of people who are brand new and don't have any background at all. Like maybe they just rolled the dice on me. I don't want to go into something really um, super technical and lose them right away. I just don't think that's fair. Uh, so in every one that I do, unless it's clearly for advanced uh, users, I try to do some basics to sort of walk through the basics. So I would love to see if you have a camera on by show of hands, who is uh, who is sort of a professional or does this stuff regularly. And then I guess I can judge by if you don't, then your hands that up. And then I would know that you're a, new, a newbie, I guess. I don't know. So let's see your hands if you do this regularly. All right, so we do have a few people that are, that are new to it. That's good. Um, so um, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna draw while I talk. Hopefully I can do both at the same time. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with uh, my Neuland marker. Uh, so this is a Neuland Fine One Outliner, which is permanent, water-based, refillable, tips are replaceable, kind of neat. So I've sort of fallen in love with these things. So I'm gonna start with a title side by side up at the top. And what I'm gonna show you uh, is two line lettering. And you'll sort of see it when you see the S here. Maybe what I'll do is I'll just bring this up and you can take a look and see I've got two lines there. So what I do is I build uh, one, let, one side of the letter and then add a second line and then fill them in. And I think actually, so before I begin, I actually did this and forgot that I did this. So we're going to do, uh, put that in the right order. So this is sketch note live by, uh, side by side. Here's what we're going to go through today. So we're going to go through the five elements of drawing. And that's uh, my foundational drawing approach that helps non-artists sort of approach drawing. We're going to talk about the seven patterns of sketch noting that I discovered when I started to prepare for my book uh, so that I could better understand what are the common ways that I see sketch notes sort of forming. We're going to talk a little bit of brief, really briefly about templates and how they can be valuable in a lot of cases for teaching, but also having something that you can sort of lean on when you're in a jam. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about hierarchy and white space and why those are important. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to do a live sketch note. And I told Brian, I wanted to be challenged a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to sketch note something that he's going to talk about. We'll deconstruct what I did and then I'll try to explain my approach to things. And that'll be, uh, Brian's going to present something for us. Um, and then finally, we'll have Q&A. We'll have time for Q&A, about 30 minutes, I think we said. We can, you can share your work and we can talk about that. You can uh, get feedback on that and you can ask questions. So that's going to be the flow of today. So I'm going to jump right back in here and um, continue with my title. So you can see 
um, I'm sort of working my two line. Sometimes like I see spaces like this and I'll try and sneak in a little letter so you can see now I've got two lines and I'm filling them. So the beauty of the two line method is uh, it's real easy to follow this, the first line and do a, a second line with it uh, and then fill it and it looks like a nice bold line but you don't have to worry too much about getting it right because you're just following the other line. So compare that. So I'm going to show you. So that's the two line. I'm going to do the C in a, in, um, a different way. So if I, if I did it this way, which is certainly possible, notice how much longer it took me to produce the C. Like I had to be really careful about making sure that the C was matching and then I can fill it in. So by starting this way with a single line, you sort of have a reference point. I almost think it's like your secret template that you're using. And when you're done, nobody knows that you cheated. But I wouldn't call it cheating. I would just call it being smart. So let's just continue with that. Here's my N. And we're going to get to S's. So I guess you're, gonna, you're getting a little bit of lettering technique here. Do our O. So what I've, you'll see that I've written the O sort of at the same height as the N, and on the inside I'll put my second line. The good thing is if you goof up a line, you can like come in here and touch it up since you're filling it in anyway. So let's do the T. And if you'd like to follow along, that would be awesome. I'm actually going to tuck my little E in right here under the T just because I feel like it. And I sort of like a loose feel. So I, I don't want it to be too perfect. So I like these little feet that are hanging off and the little white marks. I just leave those in. It sort of gives it a nice human touch. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do uh, a little bit more on this headline and it's going to be the word side by side. And the reason I'm going to show that is so one of the tricks that I learned when I do a two line S is this. So you start with the single line. I like, I like starting on the inside with the second line, but when I get to the downstroke, I actually cross over to the other inside. So it looks a little weird right now, but the reason I do that is because right here, if you didn't do that, it would get, it could be really tricky. It gives you a little more control. So I can do the bottom and top part of the S and then I can start to work it. I sort of work from the middle out until it matches. It just gives me a little bit of latitude to sort of work it out instead of getting in the jam. So we'll do the side. You'll notice I'm doing a very square D. I really like these compressed or condensed Ds like this. I think I goofed up and made the B a little bit too tall, but that's okay. I can kind of absorb it a little bit. Notice on that one, I put the, the heavy stroke on the inside of the Y and then the other one on the outside. The reason if I did both on the inside, the Y would get all plugged up. Even so, it's a little bit heavy, but at least it avoids plugging up the Y. What I might do is actually come in and beef up the B a little bit. So a lot of this for me is like about balance, sort of getting it to feel right more than being technically right. Something I learned as a designer a long time ago is you could technically put things in the right place, but it might still optically be not right. That's something I've, I've remembered. So I'm much more concerned about making it feel right and look right than if you measured it, that it would measure right. I'm just about done with my headline here. I'm kind of going fast. I, I kind of want this loose feel to it. And it's very bold, you can see, right? So there we go. There's a, there's a quick headline. You see I've worked pretty hard to kind of, like as I'm getting closer here, I sort of worked it so that the E's lined up a little bit. And now I can actually go in and look and see 
I want to just widen that E a little bit, just visually so it's lining up, it feels like it's lined up. All these little tricks. Trust your eyes, I think I would say, because your eyes will tell you what's right and what's not right. And as you practice, you'll get better at noticing things. Now I could come back, I could noodle this thing forever. I could get another pen and fiddle with it, but I don't want to go too crazy. I'm just going to sort of sharpen up anything that I see. Maybe you could use a touch up. Looks like you got something on my page here. All right. So I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch away from that marker and I'm going to switch to a new pen that I discovered that you may want to check out. Um, I found it at Target of all places. And it's Sharpie. You know, the Sharpie people that make permanent markers, they make other pens too. And they just released the gel called the S gel. And the thing that I most like about it is a 1.0, it's super thick. I tended like thick, heavy lines. Um, it's got a nice grip on it. What's kind of cool too is um, <laughs> I realized that you can pull the cartridges out and you can put them in other pens. So I have actually a pen that I carry in my pocket that is not a clicker because my concern about clickers is I'm gonna click it open and then it's gonna open in my jeans and I'm gonna wreck my jeans. So I actually have another pen that I use that um, takes this uh, cartridge. So what I want to talk about now is um, the five elements of drawing, because that's going to be the first thing we talk about. So I'm going to use a similar process and do two line. Which, I don't know if you can see this or not, but like I'm going to fill these in and you can see the boldness. Maybe I'll bring the I may bring the book up to the camera just so you can see the boldness of the Neuland markers. I don't know if I could have a, if you can see that. I guess maybe on camera you can't see it as well, but um, the Neuland marker, that ink, whatever that pigment is, really super dense, super dense uh, pigment. So that's something that's kind of cool. The other kind of nice thing about the Neuland outliner is um, it's permanent. And, and I think waterproof. So now if I go in with the highlighter from Neuland, I can lay it right on top of it and it won't pick up the color, which is kind of cool. So let's continue here. I'm gonna, call, I'm gonna do the title here, the five elements of drawing. Something funny I notice about myself is when I draw and I talk is sometimes I do typos because I'm not paying attention like I normally do to prevent myself from making a typo. It looks like my spring got messed up in here, so I'm gonna open this thing up if I can. There we go. Here I'm gonna do a little script. Just I just have the feeling for script, so I'm gonna do like an, an other than script like that. and then come back to the two-line lettering. The way you see me doing two-line lettering is more like the way I would actually do it in practice. Even though I teach it more slowly for someone who's new, I'm probably more likely doing it something like this. So now you see I'm coming to the point where I realize the subhead is actually hanging off over this. So it makes me think, what can I use that space for? So I'm not sure yet, but I think maybe I could put Nova Scribes or the date or something in this space. So the way I think a lot of times when I'm working is like, that's an interesting space. Wonder what I could use that for. Let's put that, I'm gonna shelve that and come back to it. Maybe we'll come back and have a solution for that later. So here's our five elements of drawing. And I'm gonna draw these different shapes. So there's the square. Here I'm going to use regular all caps, just regular writing. Circle. Third one is a triangle. Ooh, I made a typo. See, I sort of, I started making an E out of it, so I stopped myself before I did the second stroke. And maybe it's passable. <laughs> so maybe I would fix, if this was, something I was doing for someone, I'd probably fix this a little bit. And then a line. 
and then a dot. So those are the five basic elements that I teach in the books. Um, and what that ends up, the way that ends up expressing itself is, um, I think of it almost like, I call them like using Legos to draw. And here I'm gonna use my two line, sort of emphasize this. Right there. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'll do a little arrow because I'm going to do an example over here. So one of the common ones I do first is a triangle on top of a square like this. And so that shows that this uh, is a house. Now, of course, I think what I'm going to show is progression. So let's do a little arrow between them. So here's the door. Let's do another progression. A line for the window on the door. Maybe I'll put the dot. I'll do another progression. So this might be good to show someone who um, wants to see the process step by step. So now you see I've added a window upstairs. And more. And I'm not worried that these aren't exactly the same. Who cares? And then this one, I'll put a smokestack. And maybe it'll be on my line. Then I think what I'm going to do is to reinforce this. I'm going to say, do piece the five elements. together. So this is sort of showing. And I've sort of compressed this a little bit. I probably could do a step for every different change, but what I've realized is that I wouldn't have fit it and also had the text here. So I've just compressed it a little bit. But what's kind of cool is you can see this progression from a really simple shape all the way to the more finished shape, even though I've added a few steps together. And then I think the so the next concept is the idea of the visual library. So let's do another uh, subhead here. You can see I'm actually building a hierarchy. So one of the things we, we wanted to talk about was hierarchy. Ooh, I, I caught myself again talking and typing. So I could make it like a I could make it an umlaut. Will that work? The Germans would never go for that. But again, if I was going to do this for um, production or for a client, I would just fix that in Photoshop or something. Or I could use whiteout. So I need to be careful not to talk when, uh, when I need to make sure I'm spelling something properly. <laughs> okay, so now we've got our visual library. So the concept behind the visual library is that of um, building a collection of your own icons. And I'm, I'm, I'm making the decision to break the line at the same place. because I'm going to do something here. I don't know what that is. I'm just leaving space for this. So you can see I'm sort of starting to build like I've got like a little gap here for something's going here. I don't know what it is. I'm starting to develop like almost like a grid line going down the page, invisible grid line. That's sort of saying this is going to be a column because I've sort of stopped here and I'm using this as my break. So it's building a collection of your own, your own icons to use when you need them. And so what I think I would draw here is in the sketch note handbook and workbook both. What I did is on the pages in the back, actually, and then also in, uh, in this book, actually, 
we've got these pages designed for uh, Sketchnote Library. So you've got the large icons here, so you can do concepts. And then we've got the shorter icon. You see I was playing around with um, ideas for how to do a laptop, and then I sort of settled on this as my laptop icon. So you're sort of building up these concepts. And the idea is that you could have like a grid, let me fix that, just a plain grid on a sheet of paper or in the back of a notebook or something like that. And you're doing little icons in here. Maybe on this one, I'll just draw a pen, right? So I'm going to do, an, I'm going to be more instructional here. I'm going to say, build your own library. With the grid, I think I can fit grid in here. Let's sign up. My sheet. Printer paper. I'm going to put a long dash in there because I'm going to follow it. Fill it with simple icons. I'm going to do more descriptive, so I'm going to say loose sheet. Back of a sketchbook. So now I'm starting to think like, what am I going to use this column for? Maybe what I could do is, um, but remember I, I saw that laptop back here. What if I started doing little icons? Let's do our laptop here. Laptop. And one I like to do that's kind of fun is it's a Coffee. It could be interesting in here to suggest something specific, but I'd have to think about kind of working off of memory here. So, um, I'm just going to do my symbol for a dog. Dog. What else can we do? Maybe a car. Simple car. Kind of like arrow. So what I'm going to do is do an arrow. I'm going to do a two line arrow here. Just come back in here and get that second line on it and then fill it in. I want to emphasize the arrow. And then maybe this is actually a cloud shape. Just sort of feeling it. I've got the space to pull it off. Come back from here. Starts to build sort of an interesting visual. Maybe I'll say something fun like fill. Fill it up. Notice I'm trying to be focused on Spelling it right before I, <laughs> before I draw it. All right, so here we have the first page mostly completed. 
I think I want to come back in here. I've, I've been thinking about this. I think I want to circle. After I did that cloud, it just felt like a circle was the right shape. Couldn't tell you why. I'm going to make it a bold one. And then I'm going to put uh, Nova in here. Hopefully I can fit it. I think I'm going to do scribes a script. A little tight. And this is September 3rd. Right? I'm going to do 2020 in an interesting way. I'm just going to stack it because I know I have the space for it. Just have a little fun with it. And I'm trying to you notice I'm lining this up too. So there's all these invisible grid lines. I guess as a designer, I've sort of learned to do all this stuff. So I've got a line coming across, invisible line here. This is sort of here. It's not exactly, you know, this is not exactly lined up, but it's more, these sort of run as a unit and this runs as a unit. So now I've got our first page filled. All right, I think we talked about doing, um, focusing on, let's see what I have next. Seven patterns. So I think actually, let's check these off. So we did the five elements of drawing, right? Uh, we talked a little bit about hierarchy. So hierarchy is, you know, your headline, subheads, and then text. Um, and I think this is really important to make sure that you, you have sort of variability. I think you all kind of know this, right? That when you have this variability and this em emphasis, it's really clear, where do I look first on the page? And it sort of gives you uh, an order that you're looking at without having to explicitly tell somebody which way to look. Like it just sort of directs them along the page. I think uh, when I talk about white space, I think white space also does the same. So <laughs> making sure that I've got enough space here and here, notice that I'm, I'm not really gonna mess with this right now. I'm leaving this alone. And I, I kind of worked hard to give some space between these elements. This is probably the tightest package right here. And that's, you know, I sort of traded white space for the cloud, but I think I liked how the cloud sort of, you know, bring some focus back over to this, this over here. Maybe since I'm saying filler up, I'll just put in the rest of the icons here, right? Just little smid smidges. Maybe I'll even do like a second sheet behind it. Okay. So white space is really important to kind of balance. Like sometimes I get a little bit uh, excited and I might fill in too much area and it just gets a little tight. So even here, like fill her up, I just careful to leave a little space. Just, it sort of relieves your eye. I think the other thing that white space does is it tends to push you toward the dark imagery that you see on the page. So that's the benefit of uh, using white space in, in a useful way. So now let's switch over. Uh, what I'm gonna do is talk about, um, I think we have to talk about the seven patterns. So here we've talked about uh, white space and hierarchy. In some ways, this is a template. So building a template like this, a grid like this to build your own visual library as a template. And I'm gonna talk about something else after that, that that might be helpful, especially for kids uh, or anybody who's doing teaching. So let's first talk about the seven patterns. Let's do our subhead style. So it's about the same style. And stay with the upper lower case. And make sure I'm spelling right while I'm talking. So our seven patterns. So the seven patterns are these. And I've actually developed icons in the sketchnote handbook that I use. Let's see if I can pull them off. The first one is called linear. And this is basically um, any book that you read from top right to bottom, or top left to bottom right, and left page to right page. So any Western book, I guess as you go east, that changes, right? It goes the opposite direction, or can go in the opposite direction. So this is sort of my default. I use this all the time. Um, I would in some ways call this a template as well, because if I'm ever in a jam, if I don't want to worry too much about structure, I go right to linear because I know it so well. Every book I've read, um, 
conforms to it. So it's easy to just do it and not have to think too much. Uh, so that tends to be my default. That's number one. Uh, the second one, it's called radial. And what that is a lot like a mind map. So you start in the middle with uh, the title or the focus, and then you have these objects that radiate outwards with tidbits of information. Now it doesn't have to follow this exact pattern. The shape in the containers don't even have to exist, but the idea that the center of the page is where the focus is, and then all the elements in the outside support that centerpiece is the, is the concept behind radio. The third one is called vertical. And that is, it can be a horizontal page or it can be a vertical page. But the idea is that everything just runs straight down the page. Like there's no, like you're not considering like a, a fold like this, in this book, there's a break. Um, so there, and there's ways to use a book like this and still do vertical going straight down. But this, the idea is here is maybe it's a single sheet of paper and you're running top to bottom. So now we're at number four. Number four is path. So this is kind of a fun one. I think lots of graphic reporters use this. Right? So you start in the, like a certain point, maybe it's top left, it could go the other way. And you sort of follow a path of items and there could be drawings and text and things all the way along the path until you arrive at the end. Just a way of thinking about using that space. Another one is modular. This is number five. And the idea here is you break the space into chunks. And for this symbol I use, like the top part could be the header and these could be four sections. Now that can be not limiting it to that, but that's just a representative icon. It could be any kind of modular structure that holds information that maybe is related or, or maybe just tangential, right? They're, but having them separated clearly helps with the communication of that information. Number six, this one's called Skyscraper. And the idea behind this one is, this is very good for panels. So I'm showing three, but it could be six or it's probably an upper limit that you could probably manage. But the idea is that you would have a, one column for each speaker. So if you have a panel, panel of people, you could have a column for each speaker. And as they say things, you're filling in tidbits of information until your page is full. And it's an easy way to manage when you have lots of people talking, when it can often be difficult any other way. And number seven is popcorn. And the idea here is that you don't really have any structure at all. You're just sort of placing things on the page and having some fun uh, with those. And actually the, the book here that um, the sketch and idea boy actually has all seven of these patterns listed in the back for reference. Okay. So I think um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about here are templates. And I'm gonna specifically talk about really useful templates. This is something I discovered when I was teaching in schools. And the idea was you could take a regular sheet of copier paper and you could either draw on it with a marker or you could um, do this on your computer and print it out. I would use this as a way to provide structure for teachers that were learning how to sketch note. And then the idea is that they would pass it on to their students. So here's the idea that you have a sheet of paper that's got um, a, a template on it. Here you would have a space for a headline or some focus area. And then these would each be subject areas. And the concept is that you would take another sheet of plain printer paper, that's just plain, you give it to the student. And underneath it, you would have, you know, the shape. And what you would see is when you lay it on top of there, it almost looks like a gray image, right? like this, I'm trying to replicate it with dots, right? So when you lay that sheet on there, you can see through it. The cool thing is, is for a student, and this can be any, you know, you can do any template, you can do any of these seven, you can do custom ones. 
The idea is that you, the student will lay a sheet of paper on top of the template and they'll do their sketch note. And in some ways it's sort of like, like training wheels on your bicycle, right? So on your bicycle, you have, you know, training wheels. Like my son just learned how to ride, right? And it keeps you from tipping over either way, but eventually you get pretty good at balancing and then you can take those off. The same idea here is uh, you can give assignments, you can build a template with any of these seven or custom templates. You could take the same content. So as an example, you could have your students watching TED videos or YouTube videos, right? And then challenge them to run it through every one of the seven templates and see which one they like. You could even like play around with different videos and see which kind of video is actually good for which format. Let them play with it. Uh, and it's kind of cool because once you pull the sheet out, it's really great because the student has a really cool sketch note. And it looks like they just made it, right? Because there's no pencil lines, there's no, nothing's there. But it looks like they've got the structure. So it's a really, it's a really good way to build confidence. So um, I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause. Where are we at, Brian? We're at 5 o'clock. We're at 6 o'clock. So we've been going about, man, we've been going 40 minutes already? Yeah, time flies when you're having fun. Wow. Okay. So we're at 40 minutes in. Um, we've got another hour and 20 minutes, something like that. And we have 30 minutes Q and A, so that leaves little time. Uh, Brian, what I want to do now is um, have you do your talk and I'm just going to sketch it. I'm not going to say anything and we'll come back and we can deconstruct after I'm done and sort of talk about what I did. Should, um, do you think I should just continue on the page where I'm at? Or should I start with a new page? What do you, how do you feel about it? Well, how long would you like me to speak for? So let's see, if we're at five, I would guess about maybe 15 minutes so we have time to deconstruct. Yeah, I can do that. I'm trying to think, of, can I fit 15 minutes of content and how technical is it gonna be? Um, <laughs> not, not very technical. Okay, how about we roll with it and we'll see what happens. If I have to roll to another page, then that'll be a lesson in itself. Okay, that sounds good. Um, do you need anything up front or should I just jump into it? Maybe if you wanna, for everyone, cause they're also absorbing it. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little, give us sort of a, an intro about yeah. what you're gonna talk about and then go into detail. And meanwhile, what I'm gonna, you see what I'm doing is uh, writing Brian's name up on top. Mm -hmm. So the thing that I'm gonna talk about is really about the mindset of facilitating online. Mm. It's the kind of things that you'd have to keep in mind uh, as we're transitioning from in-person to the online space, especially for facilitators. And I wish I could say I'm going to give you X number of points on this, but I'm just going to talk for 15 minutes okay. and then I'm going to stop. <laughs> okay. Um, are you ready for me to go? Go for it. Cool. So the first thing that I want to talk about is fundamental to any kind of facilitation. Um, and I like to think of it as the presentation participation spectrum. And so if you were to imagine a spectrum of light uh, that on the one hand, you'd have presentation. And with presentation, this is about instruction. We're informing people. The goal here is to teach. Uh, we're telling. And it's very frontal and didactic. And the role of the, the learner, the participants, is to receive information. Um, you're going to go off and having learned some smarts as a result of what you've heard. On the other side of the spectrum is one of participation. And this is where co-creation is. This is where co-learning is. The activity here is collaborative between the participants. Um, I believe that this is where really true facilitation lies. Um, and the role of the participants here is to share in the decision making. They share the responsibility for the outcome and their actions are generative with each other. And I think that before you do anything else uh, around your design, whether you're in the room or you're online, is to first decide where do you stand on that spectrum? Because most meetings are not all or, or nothing. Um, if you are more towards the left side, the presentation side of things, 
There's nothing wrong with, for example, PowerPoint and a shared screen. It scales infinitely. Thousands of people can look at it. But understand that you're not going to have a lot of participation from the group. Um, on the far other side, on participation, then the technology that suggests itself has to be more participatory. 100 people in a Zoom call is not a meeting. That is a town hall. And so if your goal is to be more participatory, then you should be using breakouts liberally, small groups of anywhere from four to six, using collaborative technology. So for example, collaborative whiteboards like Mural or Miro or Jamboard, um, or even shared documents like Google Docs, Google Sheets, um, Filer is another one, Smartsheet is another one. Um, and so the first decision I think that you have to make is where do you stand on that participation presentation spectrum? Um, another one is about the mindset that you take for yourself when you go into a virtual facilitation. So I like to think about virtual facilitation as sort of like that scene in Apollo 13. And if you haven't seen it, Apollo 13 has got Tom Hanks, you know, America's hero. Uh, and they're on their way to the moon and something breaks and they're losing oxygen and everything goes to hell in a handbasket. And the engineers come bursting into a room carrying cardboard boxes and they say, this is everything that the astronauts have in that capsule. And we have to figure out how to connect a square peg into a round hole so that the astronauts can continue to breathe. And you know, in the back of their minds, these engineers were scared, but they'd also been living for this moment. This was the moment of their lives. That they were, or how do we kludge this together to get something that we need? Now, if we were in the room, we would have large paper, we'd have sticky notes, uh, we would have um, flip charts, markers, we would have all the tools of collaboration. Online, it's like, okay, what do we have with us? Well, we have our webcams, we have PowerPoint, we have Mural, we have Zoom. Um, and maybe if we're lucky, the participants will have sticky notes and pens or markers that they could draw something and show. But the mindset is the same. We have to think about what are the things that we have around us and how do we kludge them together such that we can fit a square peg into a round hole. So one of the most kinetic activities that you can do is the marshmallow challenge, where you use pieces of spaghetti and a marshmallow. How in the world would you do something like that online? Well, you have to deconstruct it into its goal. What is the purpose of the marshmallow challenge? And depending on what uh, experience you're trying to create, it may be to demonstrate um, agile design and rapid innovation. It might be to expose some team dynamics. Uh, it might be to look at um, uh, iteration. But if you can think about what the outcome is that you're trying to achieve, how do you use those things that are in the box, the PowerPoint, the mural, the Zoom, what have you, in order to replicate those same experiences? So again, it's like the mindset is like those NASA engineers. This is what we've got. How do we fit a square peg into a round hole? Something else that I think is critically important for virtual facilitation is designing around energy and engagement. Um, online meetings are draining. You have to make a case for people's attention. Um, it is so easy to click away and get distracted. And what can happen is, is that if the presenter is speaking for too long, participants will go into movie mode. And I like to think of movie mode is imagine that you're going into a darkened theater and you've got your popcorn, you've got your Coca-Cola, you sit back, you relax, and you become a passive receiver of information when you're in movie mode. If presenters speak for too long, usually longer than five minutes, and I'm taking a risk here by speaking for 15, uh, if presenters for, speak for too long, there's a risk that participants will go into movie mode and become, pa become passive receivers rather than actively engaged in whatever content is that you're trying to share with them. When they go into movie mode, you better hope that your movie is interesting because if it isn't, distraction is just one click away. So how do you account for that? How do you design to maintain energy and engagement? The first thing is, is to cut your outcomes by half. There can be a tendency, especially for facilitators who are working with clients who want to demonstrate value and squeeze every outcome that we can out of our time together, our precious time together, 
to say, we're going to solve these 10 things. Your participants are going to be with you for maybe two things, and then they're going to check out. I think it's better to say, we've only got two things to do together today. And if we get those two things done, then we're done. No big deal. So cut your outcomes by half. Do not expect to lift an eight hour program that you're gonna do in person and put it online. Cut your outcomes by half. The second is to pad your time. Here's what I mean by that. If you think about it, airlines have actually gotten really good at this for a while. Now, I live right next to Dulles Airport. I used to um, fly to LaGuardia all the time for work. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that the flight time between Dulles Airport and LaGuardia is 45 minutes. I know this, right? I've timed it on my watch. And yet, my ticket always says your flight time is going to be one hour and 15 minutes. It always says that. But here's what happens. We start, we start the flight, we get onto the plane, maybe we leave a little bit late, we're in the air, and then we're coming down into New York, and the captain gets on and says, hey, just to, le- just to let you know, we were able to shave 15 minutes off your flight time. It only took an hour rather than an hour and 15 minutes. And everybody on the plane starts cheering, yay. I'm like, wait a minute, we're 15 minutes late, what the heck? But the airlines have gotten really good at setting expectations that things are gonna take longer than they may actually if you're cutting things down to the wire. So I think in a lot of ways we need to pad our time. If you're thinking about a breakout activity um, and you're putting groups into breakouts for say 15 minutes, you think it's gonna take 15 minutes, Give them 20, right? If you think something's going to take 30 minutes, give it 45. That extra time will allow for, number one, any sort of technical breakdown that you didn't see coming in. Number two, people who need a little bit of extra help transitioning into the technology. But number three, it'll, and I think this is most important, it will let folks synthesize the content and really soak in whatever it is that, uh, that you need them to hear. So pad your time. If you think it's going to take 15 minutes, make it 20. And by the way, one of the things that I've, I've noticed, especially since we've gone more virtual, is that groups are checking in with each other. Colleagues who haven't seen each other are spending a little bit of time saying, hey, Mike, how's it going? How are you staying sane? How's the family? And so what I would, I would say, especially in breakouts, build that time in. Say, you know what? We think that this activity is going to take you about 15 minutes. We're actually going to give you 20. Take those first five minutes and just check in with each other. Check each other's sanity. See how you're doing. Because here's the thing. A lot of people are going to do it anyway. So you might as well build it in and create a little bit of humanity as a part of it. Okay? So pad your time. The other thing that I would say around designing for energy and engagement is to insert intervals of participation. So I warned about the danger of movie mode, which is when a presenter speaks for 15 minutes at a time. So rather than just doing a 15 or 20 or 30 minute talk, if you're talking to the boss and the boss is saying, okay, we're gonna kick off this four hour meeting and I'm gonna start with a 30 minute presentation of where we are. I say, you know, boss, I think that's a great idea. And here's how I think that we should do this in order to really make sure that our time together is best spent. Rather than doing a 30 minute presentation live, what I'd like you to do is to record a video. Record a video of yourself and then send it out in advance. Because if your goal is to present something, to inform, that doesn't need to be a meeting. Let's save the meeting time for the meeting. Let's save the meeting time for the group work. And so record a video, send a presentation in advance, write a white paper and say, in order to show up prepared for this, you need to watch this, read this, listen to this, okay? And then when it actually comes time to present, if there is some presentation, break it up a little bit. Insert quick intervals of participation. So for example, you could ask somebody to, you could ask your participants to um, answer a question in chat. You could have them draw a picture, say, here's something uh, called, (laughs) here's something called the five elements of drawing. You could share that and say, draw an icon that represents a successful outcome. And then people would show it in their webcams. You could have them write a note. You could have them write a note uh, either in chat or just take a note for themselves. Give them a quick 30 seconds to say, all right, you've heard a lot. Take just about 30 seconds for yourself, find a piece of paper, write your top three ideas. What were the top three ideas that you got out of what you just heard? Um, Answer a poll. Zoom has got a break in built in uh, poll function. I really love Mentimeter as another tool. Poll Everywhere is another one. 
Um, but I really like Mentimeter. There's some amazing templates that are built into that. Um, and I think really, if you want to engage people, the secret there is to get people into breakouts as quickly as possible, breakouts of four to six, and get them talking with one another. Mike, that was about 12 minutes. Should we stop there? It looks like you're running out of room. Yeah. Should we call it? Yeah, I was just trying to <laughs> fit it into my space, so that was a little bit of me. I can maybe talk through, I'm trying to think if I want to, if there's a quick way that I can zoom this without, I just had an idea. Is that helpful? Is that a little better? Without having to mess with my camera? <laughs> So I've got my, I've got a color marker. One of the things I thought it was, it might be fun to actually bring color in here, but I think this color might be too dark. So I'm not going to do that. Okay. So the first thing I thought of when you said that there was a scale, I start immediately saw an opportunity to do a center line and then two sides and then sort of a gradation scale. What I might, what I might've done is like, if I was doing black and white, I might've done lines here to sort of maybe show it going darker to lighter. And then I, once I had that, um, structure in place. Then I started placing everything on it. I started describing presentation mode is instruction. You're teaching, you're telling. Student receives and learns. You talked about PowerPoints. I sort of got the feeling you didn't say this, but I thought of static. It's very static. But then also the advantage here uh, when you were talking later was the idea of recording some pre-video, right? So the static can be your, your friend um, as well. And then on the other side was participation, co-learning, collaborative. Students uh, make decisions, they drive the outcome, they're participants, not just receivers. And then you started talking a little bit about, um, then I did the arrows to sort of show that it's a two-directional. You talked a little bit about energy, and it was real easy to go, uh, the first thing I thought of was active mode. I felt like on this side, because you're doing all this stuff. Uh, and th here's the, this is my interpretation of like, um, some kind of an action, some kind of a tool, Teams or whatever. Zoom and then there's, you know, using Miro and you've got breakout rooms and you've got docs. Then, then I had this idea of this being more active because you're doing lots of stuff. So you're actually jumping around. And then movie mode, I could just imagine someone sitting in a theater with the kickback chair and, you know, the movie is playing in front of them and they're just sort of sitting there. And, and then you talked a little bit about energy. So then I folded that in and I intentionally did sort of an upward arrow. In other words, the energy could be really low here. And then I added a battery. And then on this end, maybe I would actually do a full battery, right? So your energy level goes up. Um, and then up above, later on, you talked about uh, padding your time, right? So I talked, I, I, the challenge on this side is maybe that there's a tendency to, to take more time. And like, if you're doing this uh, more participatory approach, you're, you're allowing more time. You're, you're using less time. You're using, maybe it's less time. It's the same time, but you're doing less than the same time. So it, and the thing I took away was the more time you give, you're giving people time to analyze because they're just not constantly getting bombarded with stuff, right? They've got time to think. And that sort of fits into this whole line of thinking, drawing pictures, doing chatting uh, for 30 seconds, right? These are tied together. And then that you talked a little bit about even like building in, in these breakout rooms, building in check-in time, right? And then even polls, right? So these are sort of along that path. Um, you talked a little bit about, um, and these are, this is sort of, I was trying to fit the space, which is probably not a wise move. Had I had the extra space here, maybe I would have done something, but I mean, it's an interesting challenge to sort of make it fit. Like I'm making decisions about what can I keep in and what can I, what is okay to leave out? Are there ways I can compress what Brian's saying into a simpler way? Because you said a lot more words than I captured, right? But um, compressing it is sort of a fun challenge of its own. Uh, then you talked about, you know, Apollo 13, I might have put in Apollo 13 here with the box full of junk, right, that they dump on the table and there's, you know, cables and wires and stuff in there. And that this is basically, there's a little equal sign, but it sort of got lost in the shuffle, is you're basically saying that Apollo 13 box of junk is our box of junk, which is uh, webcams and phones and um, mirror boards and laptops and maybe even PowerPoints. How do we take these things which would be real easy to go this direction and push it this direction? I didn't indicate any of that. And then in my mind, I was really feeling like the thing you were saying when you're talking about recorded video was 
using asynchronous time. So everything doesn't have to be like during the meeting that you can be smart about uh, seating people with stuff before the meeting begins. That would be a recorded video. That would be a note that could be web articles to read, like all kinds of stuff can be preloaded so that by the time you get to this thing, you're all primed and ready to go. And it's a lot more effective because all that stuff can be done at your leisure and it doesn't have to be all squashed into the same meeting. Uh, here, I've, and then I sort of captured your marshmallow challenge, I think is normally that's um, spaghetti and marshmallows or something you have to build with. Is that, if I remember right? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so that, you know, what's the outcome? What are we doing? Uh, use the tools we have and then out, uh, cut your outcomes by 50%. So be, you know, you're being realistic. So some of this is a little bit mixed up. There's not as much of a structure as maybe I would ideally like, but if I were to go back and look at this, actually, I do this all the time because in the work that I do, I run workshops. So this is actually really valuable information for me to take away, to remember these things and lean myself for the participatory side. Even the work that I'm doing here, like having you draw along is leaning more in this direction. And I keep thinking, how, what are ways that I can push myself more in this direction and stay away from this direction? Because this is where I feel like 80% of the stuff online is over here. And it's real, it's like softball, right? This is the hard ball, this is the really hard stuff. And it takes a lot of work and planning and preparation, but the benefit can really be super powerful because of the effort that you put in up front. Does that make sense? Yes, and thank you, Mike. And thank you, especially for modeling a great debrief after the fact. Sometimes my clients say, hey, talk through your chart. And I'm always like, uh, I don't know what to say. I just drew this stuff. <laughs> that, that was great to see your process of how you actually walk through the mindset of how you recorded it all. Thank you for that. that that's, that was awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. So if I go to my, I come back here. So we've done a sketch note. We sort of deconstructed and explained, I guess. I think we're now in the Q&A feedback sharing uh, period. Yeah. Um, right? Yeah, and I think Mark had left. a question from, why, from a while back. Okay. So let me just go ahead and read for her. So do you ever mix and match these patterns? So she was talking about like the seven patterns, ah. linear, radial, and so forth. That's so cool. how many kinds can you mix up without it looking chaotic and cluttered? That's really interesting. I think, um, so I think a real natural one could be like a uh, modular and linear. So you could be, um, you could have a linear thing going on and have use a modular component, like one of the pages, almost like using a table, right? You sort of put things, I think about a lot of times the way I use modular is to have similar things that are connected together, uh, but enough separation so that, that they're distinct. So, and a lot of times that can even be like, uh, I was starting along this like dashed lines to show separation. Um, that could be a, a pretty interesting mix. Um, let's see. I have done, um, I have done a little bit of a vertical on a spread. I don't, I don't know if I have my sample anymore, but basically the concept was, um, it was a sermon sketch note and the pastor was talking about uh, 2020s hindsight and immediately in my image, Maybe I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just sketch the layout for you. Immediately in my mind was this idea, and I had a two-page spread. It was a book just like this. I had the image of a rear-view mirror, like a really big rear-view mirror like this, right? And it's hanging down off the page. So that's how I started. And then in the mirror was hindsight. I think this is how it went. And then I think I did, uh, then I did like the text was running all vertically. I had like a little sidebar here and then another sidebar here and then text. And I was real, that was like, this is another um, emphasis in uh, white space. So there was tons of white space around here, around all this. This stuff was very super little text. There wasn't very much. So I was really like, it was almost like, um, squeezing it through a funnel, right? You had all this stuff on the top and this is what you got out. That was what this was, right? Squeezing all this, all this talking and stuff, going through a funnel and then it ended up being like this, like two paragraphs and some little drawings and sketches and then a mirror. That was basically all of the, a 40 minute sermon. So that was, you know, yeah, four, I think it was 40 minutes. And you could probably read this in about five minutes. 
So, you know, then there's, this is where the magic is, right? The analysis. So that's an interesting mix of where I did. You could normally do sort of a left page, right page, but it actually was uh, vertical in that sense. So they can be mixed together. I think you just have to think about how you're doing it. I could see like you could do one page in one style and one page in another, like maybe on the right you would do radial based on the content. So I always let the content drive me as much as I can. Sometimes you're, you know, I try to do as much uh, pre-work as I can, but it doesn't always work out. Sometimes you just get thrown into situations where you just kind of roll with what you want. And then, you know, my default is always linear simply because I don't have to think about it so much, right? It's this basically. It it's, takes away a decision. Like I'm always looking, I think President Obama used to say he, he like had two different kinds of suits and he did that because he didn't want to waste time making decisions about his suits in the morning. He just wanted to, he wanted to spend that energy on deciding about, you know, uh, serious topics, so. Well, thanks for that, Mike. So one of the things that we had uh, put into the, uh, the description for this was the chance to get some feedback. Yeah, um, that would be awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel Mike's spotlight video. Okay. And if Zoom is going to cooperate with us, if you have something that you'd like to share. Um, I'm my screen really big too, so I can see. Yeah, thank you. So is there anybody that would like to get some feedback for Mike? Martha. Okay, so Martha's hand first. So Martha, go ahead and go off mute. I'm going to spotlight your video. Hey, Martha. Hi, oh, look at you. It looks like a split image, man. I just got my book. All right. How does it feel? It feels nice. Awesome. So Let's see here's following do. along with you, which is really interesting. I felt like I was a yeah. little bit under control over here. Yeah. Sort of over here. Yeah. Losing it here, and now this. This was really, I felt pretty good over yeah. here, but down here you can see, wow. And I would expect that in the lower right because I was kind of out of control myself in the lower right. <laughs> so the here. challenge, you did pretty good. It just oh. feels like it doesn't have those nice columns, you know? Um, yeah. And I don't, I guess that's just practice. I think a little bit of it is, I think, um, you know, going back to the template idea, it might uh -huh. even help. It wouldn't work in this kind of case, but I guess you could use pencil and like lay out your page right. with pencil and sort of train yourself. Right. Um, you know, I've had many years being a designer to sort of visually like in, have those invisible uh, margin lines. Okay. So I've, I've got a humongous advantage that I would never expect anyone else who doesn't have, had, had, doesn't have that experience to have. Um, I just really like, I'm, I really like how you did that. I like your lettering. You fit everything in there. That's pretty cool. I knew that the seven patterns would be a challenge because that, that was getting tight near the end. So yeah, it's like, that's, yeah, I, I haven't, you know, I, I get, um, I get stuck on the, on the detail in it and yeah, I should have heard been cued by seven and then just kind of thought, well, maybe I, I that's should. again, that's a spatial awareness thing. And sometimes yeah. I get that wrong too. So that's, I, I like your solution there. So on the sixth one, you knew you were going to run out of space and you flipped and you put the description above. <laughs> so that was actually pretty smart because you knew you were going to get in the jam. I, you could feel it, right? Yeah. And you, so, were able, you, were, this, you were able to fit, even on the one that I was doing live, you were able to fit all that information. So how did you, I don't know how you were able to watch me and draw at the same time. You, I think you did more work than I did. Well, yeah, because it's harder for me. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I, I have a good hand-eye coordination, but um, in doing so, you know, I didn't do any planning. Yeah. So you could just sort of follow along, which is, I think it's, you know, it's for a little me, bit like um, modeling someone, right? So if someone else is doing it by following, you sort of pick up like, oh, I see why that works that way. Like sometimes you can pick up those things. So that would be the benefit of doing it that way. Well, definitely. I'm at a, I'm at a newbie stage. So modeling and copying um, yeah. stuff is really helpful for me before I go out on my own. Well, my wife learned how to knit off YouTube. So <laughs> I think uh, that means that you can probably model your way to being pretty good. So it's just I'm working on it, working on it. Thank you. 
This was yeah, fun. Thank you. That was that was great. I'm glad that you had fun. Yeah, it was lots of fun. Anybody else? I saw Nancy. Nancy, you want to go ahead and give it a go? Go ahead and go off mute, Nancy. Thanks. So I wasn't going to show mine. The only reason I'm going to show it is to show that I did exactly what Martha oh, did. Yeah. Which was put the heading above the last one. And I also oh, yeah. knew I just said, see, next page. I knew I'd never be able to like <laughs> fit the, it I like in. The, I like the wrapper you created around it, too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I might as well have fun with it. I like that attitude. Thank you're you. Having a bit of fun. And I think, um, you know, I've always said I would rather have something like on the top there, even, even though the skyscraper was above. Like in some ways it kind of works, right? Because the skyscraper is the tallest. So you could make the argument that that's actually the, you know, the taller building, right? So. I, I did it on purpose for that reason. So you could, thank you, you for you noticing. <laughs> Thank Ultimately, you. Yeah, I believe sketch notes are really about um, they're first for you and then second for somebody else, right? So, if you if you're able to do them and they work for you, that's that's really your key use. And if someone else can get something out of it by looking at it, then that's like a cherry on top, right? That's great. Anybody else? Me. Casey, you scratching or? Me. Sonia. Okay, Sonia. Okay, I did it in separate pages. Okay. And what okay. I use it is not only painted, but in the blue, with the blue paint, I was writing your, your explanations. Oh. So, oh, okay. uh, you can see why yeah. it's in Spanish, uh, the blue things are written in Spanish. Huh? Oh, okay. And then, you say, maybe here we see it better. Oh, let me see. Oh, yeah, I there's put, seven. You just build up, you use the whole and page. And then I put, uh, your explanation so it's easy for me to remember later what you said and it was a little bit of chaos when I get to the final page <laughs> because it's too many oh, too many oh, information you know, been, yeah yeah so a little bit lost there but uh, <laughs> I was trying to follow you and writing so you know, too much information <laughs> yeah and, yeah but That's good really thing so that what's it what I take away from that is the first two pages you were you're okay like breaking from the pattern that I was doing. You sort of just made it your pattern. You made it, you just decided, I'm, a, I'm only going to do so much per page. But what's interesting is when you got to the last one, maybe because it was all coming so fast, you know, Brian was just talking fluidly, right? That's the yeah. challenge. That's the thing that um, I'll sort of catch myself like writing too much sometimes. And I'll have to stop and say, okay, this is sketch noting, not just noting, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll have to stop myself. Sometimes you can get into a mode where you simply get on a, you're on the train and the train is going and you don't stop. Cause like the first two pages you had separated and the third one, you were just in such a mode that you just started filling the page and you didn't yeah. follow the same pattern. So that was, if that's interesting. Um, I don't know, like maybe if you can think back to what the trigger was that had you not break up Brian's talk into more space. I mean, I, I knew that I, if I flipped the page, then I would have a partial page. And I was trying my best to fit it on a page. I think sometimes I can get you into trouble, right? Where you try to fit too much on a page. And maybe for me, it would have been better to flip the page and start over, right? Mm -hmm. So space is always a challenge. Even after you've done it a long time, uh, space is just really challenging. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you run into space problems, that's everybody's problem. Thanks for that, Sonia. Anybody else? Julia. Okay, Julia. So obviously I've got a different accent and I'm the other side of the world. So I just, this is um, Brian's talk, so Squish Down. And it's coming out backwards. I kind of like oh, it. No. Uh, for us, it's right though. For us, we can read it. <laughs> I think it's Zoom that flips it inverted. I don't know why it would do that. Oh, that's oh. horrible. <laughs> I like the way you emphasize mindset in the bottom underneath the box of things. Like you did a much better job of organizing that information. I really like the way you blackened up the, the two-sided arrow. That was something I thought about and I didn't do. In fact, I was thinking of uh, coloring it in, but you're also bringing in color, which I like. And then the real emphasis on cutting your assumptions by 50%. Thank Mike, you. what kind of when you do draw with color, what kind of color do you like to use? 
Um, well, actually, um, Neuland makes really nice color markers, but there's uh, others. I tend to like something that's lighter that complements the black. In fact, I was going to use some color. I'm going to try it. I've got a really iridescent blue color, and I'm going to do the my arrow and just see what it looks like. You can see it's pretty bright. There, it looks almost blue, but it's actually a little bit more of an aqua. I think they have, they also have a nice, uh, like a like a, a lighter blue. So if I wanted to show you that, what would I do? Nice. You can see that it's a little bit softer. Yeah, I think that's the 305 and the 303. Yeah, let me see if you're right. Oh, you won 303 and 305, you got it. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. In case anybody wanted to get Mike's colors. <laughs> I've also seen you use uh, yellows and oranges. Yeah, I like bright colors. And I, I typically will do um, one color with a black. So I'll have a bright color in, in the black, whether it's teal or whatever. Another one, and I can, I'll flip to the next page and I'll show you this other tool that I, I like and I sort of challenge myself with. It's um, there's not, not really a label on it. It's a Pentel brush pen. And it produces um, really nice brush letter like this. So I've been practicing. This is actually in a really nice place that it's a little dry. And if you can see that on the Y, it's really, it's not really zooming in, but it's sort of like not fully 100% black. I sort of like that dry brush. It almost looks like Japanese, you know, writing or something. But I challenge myself to do drawings with it too, because it's such an, a unique thing, right? It forces, what I think I like about it is it, it's so, Difficult to get uh, real fine detail. It sort of forces you to simplify your drawings. And so when I do, like if I do food sketch notes, a lot of times I use that if I'm gonna draw a taco. You know, it just sort of has a nice bold look to it. And it forces me to think differently about the, the tool and the images that I'm drawing. There's my taco shell. Thank you. Anybody else? I mean, I know everybody was drawing. Andrea, way to go, Andrea. Okay. Hi, guys. Hey. I didn't attempt to try and follow the same style, but I did. I was having some fun with my Ooh, title. I like that. <laughs> and I, I was a little all over the page in terms of where I started with the elements and then going up to the templates. It's a nice, it's nice to have space to play in. That's one nice thing about a big sheet. And then this was the one that I did on I like that. Ryan's. Um, I had the same idea with the arrow, um, but I hadn't, I didn't build it out like that. Um, I was trying to put little visuals for the different tools. I like your comparison. The, the, the presentation is like a PowerPoint and the anticipation with actual people around the table. That really communicates the difference really well. Even though we're talking online, I think people still get the yeah. <laughs> participation yeah. part. Metaphor works. Yes. Otherwise, I really like coming up with stuff for the um, designing design for the energy and engagement. Brian mm -hmm. had a lot of really good visuals, visual metaphors in what he was saying that just that fit right in very easily. That's really cool. Thanks, Andrea. Anybody else? Kyle, gotcha. Okay, I'm a newbie, and I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be following uh, <laughs> the speaker or doing my own thing, so this is kind of a collaboration. Oh, I love it. So um, it's interesting how we hear and the points we take from what Brian was saying, you know, different mm -hmm. people will hear what resonates with what they need, Yeah, I think. So when he was talking about the breakout sessions and how to make them, you know, give them variety, I was, all of a sudden I thought of like a pie 
Of course, it doesn't look like a pie. So the thought was there. Now, if I had drawn it better as a pie, it would have worked. So you had your meetings, you write notes, you, you know, prepare ahead of time. And so I was half following you and then half doing how it was I heard. And of course, yeah, that's good. Apollo 13 is something that I always loved. My dad was an industrial designer. So mm -hmm. I actually, it was, you know, that's like one of the most intense scenes. And then being able to connect it with color, yeah. you know, because I had, yeah. you know, I thought, darn, this, this should have connected back to this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I had them on two opposite sides. So I grabbed the yellow to connect the two. Um, you have beautiful handwriting, by the way. You must oh. have gotten that from your dad. Well, I did calligraphy. Oh, okay. <laughs> that must be what it is. Your script is, your, all of your handwriting is really beautiful. Okay. Really bold. Like you're not afraid, you're not afraid to put letters down. I like that. But the other thing is I consistently run out of room, see where the receive uh, is. You know, uh, that is a, a habit. Mm. You know, that is consistent with everything that I do is tending to not leave enough room to the right to finish what I have. Is there any kind of exercise you can do to retrain mm. your brain on that? Well, we probably could take the thing that Brian was talking about by cutting your, um, your outcomes in half. Right. Maybe you like the thing that I do when I'm looking at space is I sort of I sort of I guess I must be counting the letters to see if I can make it. And it's a challenge to do it fast. So maybe maybe you have a tight space and you learn how to write. The other thing you could do in that case is um, change up the, the width of your letters. So you're you're sort of doing a consistent width of your letters. Maybe as you get down there, maybe your letters get narrower or something. Mm -hmm. um, but I think sometimes like practicing with a limited space and seeing what fits, a lot of it has to do with like getting used to how wide my letters are. Like they all have a width and they, and they add up and I can sort of count like, okay, I got four more letters. That's not going to fit what I'm, you know, what do I do? Do I break and go to the next line? So that might be part of it too. Yeah, Mike, one of the things that I've seen you do, uh, and a lot of sketch notes, it, it's almost like a signature of sketch notes. If you take a look at your E right in that first word sketch note. Um, oh, it under? Yeah. The other one, the other one. Like, yeah. So how it fits in the empty space of the K yeah. um, and like tucking like the C underneath the T, um, right. just really kind of like puzzle fitting the pieces together. I kind of um, love doing that too. Yeah, I think that that really, if I see something like that, I'm like, okay, this this person has, has followed Mike Rohde before. <laughs> I know my friend Rob DeMio, who's also, he's up in, up in Germantown, um, started to adopt that concept. So he uses it quite a bit too. It comes in handy when you're like, if you need to like squeeze a little space, yeah, these techniques do help reduce your width a little bit. What I might suggest, um, was it Julia who was just on? I'm trying to remember her name. I think it was Kyle. Kyle. Kyle um, is this to focus, maybe what, what your practice could be is to practice this condensed, you know, lettering. Right? Because the lettering I see you doing right now and you've got that nailed is this wider lettering, right? So maybe you take that same thing and then you just stretch it. You can see, like, if I tighten this up, I've saved, you yeah, know, exactly. that exactly. much space, right? Just so intentionally think condensed. Mm -hmm. And then I could probably, you know, like Brian was talking about, another thing I can do is like a single line with a T. Now that I've, you know, I've got the advantage of having this, right? But now that's this much less, right? You yeah. can see it's going... Now, at some point, you get so tight that it's harder to read, but you see what I'm, where I'm driving to. So but also having too much white space is, is a plus because it allows for creativity mm -hmm. of pictures and flexibility. Whereas if you do fill the space too much, things get really busy. Because then you can do stuff like this. Tacos. <laughs> do you love tacos? <laughs> <laughs> I could eat them every day. Yes.
great. Okay, awesome. anybody else? We need to make that into a sticker, Mike. I love tacos. <laughs> you can either go off mute or you can raise your hand. Anybody else want to, want to get some feedback from Mike? Marcelin. Yes. Okay, I frankly kind of did my own thing as well. Um, so any feedback is welcome, but in particular lettering, because I like to play around and that makes it messy. Mm -hmm. um, so I also went big here, go big or go home. <laughs> is that like legal? Is that like a legal pad? Oh, this is, we're beyond legal. Okay. We're like 11 by 17 here. Oh, you're a tablet, okay. Yeah, um, so this, I don't know if how well y'all can see it. I like to do this double thing and I always feel like I'm doing myself a disservice. It seems to take longer and I think it's harder to read. So I'm so trying like those, those are like really close together lines? Yeah, it's like a double line thing. Okay. Um, so I always teach like with the two line method when I teach that is you can always come back and do that afterwards. So yeah. what I'll, sometimes I'll do is I'll go through and say, oh, I didn't emphasize that and I can go in and if I've got space and I can yeah. hit it with the second line. So maybe you, maybe if your tendency is you feel like um, you're rushed doing it, maybe you save it to later. And like the fact that you could come back to it and say, yep, that I definitely want to emphasize that. It sort of verifies that it should be emphasized and then you have time to actually do it the way you want to and not feel rushed. Okay. Thank so, you. I like the, whatever the letters were, your Brian Tarallo at the top there. I don't know what you're using there, but I like that variation. Um, I like calligraphy pens actually. Yeah. So it's thick lines with saving time. Is that like a, is like a, like a wedge nib or something like that? Um, let me show you this. It is this guy. Okay. We're at Copic calligraphy S. I actually prefer the, uh, what is it, Pigram Micon 2, but that one died. So we got this one today. Sometimes it's good to take pens you don't know and force yourself to use them. You might find, like, that's what I, that's how I played around with this brush pen and found that I really liked it. So, really nice. So you got your kids off to where they needed to go and made it back in time and safely? I'm 80% today. Thank you. 80% <laughs> here. That's my wife today, dropping, picking up, dropping, picking up, running errands. Anybody else? Kat, you've been kind of, I don't know if you've been cheering, or just raising your hand. You've been cheering. Okay, got it. Okay. And else? Okay, well, if nobody else would like to, that's all right. So, Mike, I, I want you, you've been to everybody, I don't want you to be nice to me, okay? Like, I really want to get better and you do that by figuring out where, what you did things wrong. So this this is actually something I did one for uh, Aaron, who I think Aaron Gordon and um, Sarah Witt. I think Aaron was on the line, but this is a lot of sketch notes. So I'd love to like real critical feedback of this one. Well, I really like that. Um, that this, I need to switch your page. Hold on. For some reason that I think when I talk, it sort of forced me there. Okay, there we go. Let me see if I can do it. Hold on. I forced my screen to go there. Virtual readiness. So one thing I can comment is you've got sort of a odd dead space between the Let's Get Digital and the Nova Scribes. Mm. Oh. So here? Right there, yeah. And I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing, but I noticed it like as I thought about it. So I don't know what the solution is there. It feels like maybe a lot of the stuff is sort of compressed in this lower area. Like mm -hmm. maybe you could have stolen some of that white space and opened it up down here yep. I, yeah i do really like that those the way you're using those shapes though you're sort of using them as markers here in the right with the text and then you're using them as a theme all the way through in the middle there is that is that something that was taped in like right where yeah you're... i i had to cheat on that one i just did a screenshot okay. and hit print okay well i it don't was, know it was pretty dense if it works yeah that's that's a challenging one i really i do really like your the your portraits are really cool. I like how you did the portraits, I got to say. That's always a challenge for me. I like the consistency of the lettering. So this is all uh, lettering style that you've developed over time? Uh, partially, yeah. I mean, this yeah. is just like my natural handwriting right here. Um, wow. Actually, I was thinking about when Kyle was talking. So this is sort of like an architect's hand. Uh -huh. um, and architects, they write wide, right? And so, yeah. you know, Kyle, thinking about if you're trying to do spacing, um, you know, Kind of pushing against against, uh, against that tendency to, to write wide like architects do. Yeah. 
I think it's good to have like, uh, like here you can see the two, you've got virtual readiness is in sort of condensed. Now yep. you've spaced it out a little bit and then outcomes game space prep, similar face, right? And then you got let's get digital, which is more of the, you know, the architect's hand style. Mm -hmm. And that's the wide. I think it's good to have like a variety in your quiver, right? You can pull them out. And it looks to me like the, the larger writing in the inside there is sort of following a light version of the virtual readiness outcomes, that style. So you sort of stay consistent. Probably the interesting thing is that you're not, you haven't uh, had a, I guess, I guess your handwriting sort of matches the let's get digital, right? So you're doing a mix of condensed and extended together, which mm -hmm. then provides consistency. So actually you've used the word consistency about three times. How much do you think about consistency as you're doing your sketch notes? I try to, um, I guess as a designer, I've always been taught to kind of limit your, limit your font choices, limit your color choices, just so that it feels, so it's easier to connect things. Because the more things you have going on, then it's more work to kind of make sure everything fits and makes sense. So that's, that's sort of the way I sort of approach things is try to, limit my it also makes it easier to deal with it if i've got less to deal with mm. or i've got less load that i have to worry about oh i forgot to use that again that kind of i want to get in that kind of a position thanks jessica thanks for coming thanks jessica I it's down there in the chat that she has to go okay anybody else would like to get some feedback from mike kathy okay now she's not celebrating no, she is celebrating. She's not celebrating. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my. How long have we done Zoom? Um, yeah, I've been, um, I'm very thankful for this exercise in hierarchy. And one of the things I've been struggling with, and I'm not sure how you get your mindset to not make things go uphill all the time. I have a, I have a, I have a, a problem with uphill and downhill. Yeah. But I can't so, blame my astigmatism anymore, I don't think. I can tell you I have the same challenge at times, so it doesn't go away. Yeah. I like your style. Um, Thank you. Sometimes, um, and I think a lot of it is because you're leaning close to the page and you're writing and like you're not fully, it's like you can't always be looking straight down at the page and thinking about alignment. Mm -hmm. um, one way to deal with that might be to explore using a dot grid with a very light grid in it. So that you'd have oh, some yes. subtle structure okay, underneath yeah. it, right? And I, I don't know if they make these, but I wonder if there's a dot grid that has little blue dots. So when you take a photo of it, you can drop the blue. Like if you're going to do it for a client or something. Um, okay. Probably the other way I would say is if you, know, if you have a sense of the structure you're going to follow, is maybe you would get your pencil and your straight edge out and you would build sort of a grid for yourself in pencil. So that when you go okay. in and you're doing your work, you've got some reference point to remind, oh, that's right, I gotta stand, I gotta stay horizontal. You'll just sort of lock into it. And then when you're done, you erase all the pencil after it's dry. And that might be another way to approach it. It's a little more work though, cause you gotta lay down lines, but maybe you could put like a, you know, a rough grid, even if it's like, you know, four or five mm -hmm. horizontal and vertical lines. It seems to me like maybe horizontal is more of a challenge in this case. So maybe yes. just some yeah. horizontal, really light horizontal pencil lines on the page just to remind you so you have some reference point because like if you're referencing against the edges of the page they might be really far away by the time you're down here so it's really hard to make that gauge but if you've got a line that's exactly right you know and then you're done you just erase it and it's really you know nobody needs to know just like calligraphy is great idea thank you for that yeah Mike, if I may, I, I have a I might have a, a fix for Kathy so this is um just a, a, a something that I printed up Right, Ooh, there you go. and I'll put it underneath my page when I'm uh, sketch noting, just so that I can I can have that because I can't quite afford the fancy dot grid <laughs> sketch sketchbooks yeah, quite yet. Yeah. I noticed a few people have come off mute. Marceline, did you have something that you wanted to share? I actually have to run, so I'm just going to say thank you. Um, thank you hopefully, next time I catch the full thing. Yeah, well, you've got the whole thing recorded, so you can watch later. You know, yeah. get a glass of wine and put the kids to bed and. Thank you very much. How about we open it up for uh, for questions now? If we've got a little yeah, bit of time. Awesome. So if you've got something, you can go ahead and go off mute or type something into chat. Whatever works. Hi, Mike. It's, it's Martha again. My question is: 
I really struggle with coming up with that icon library. Mm. Um, I don't know if, I don't know what it is. I don't know what kind of block it is, but it's like, wow, I have to, I have to go and watch, look at, you know, like go to the noun project and look at icons yeah. or something like that. It just maybe it's just like learning a new language. Um, and I just have to get rid, get used to pictures in my head. Could be. That was the thing I was going to recommend if you hadn't already gone there is a noun project. If you do a Google search on that, you'll find it. Um, basically, it's a huge repository of every icon you could ever imagine. You type in any term and it will come up with, it may not be a good icon, but there will be icons for pretty much any term. Uh, and it makes, it's really nice because you can bring it up on your phone. You can be a member and get additional features if you really, really like it and use it. But even the free version is really useful. Um, another one would be Google search, but I think, uh, and that's the Google image search, will often have icons in there. Um, so Martha, do you, have, um, do you have sort of a running library that's sort of like a sheet where you can uh, challenge yourself to simpl simply draw things and add them into a library that way? That no, not yet. No, no, that's going to be my challenge. That will be my, my challenge. I don't yeah. have like, I haven't so, committed my, I have things on index cards. Okay. Um, but I guess it, it's, it's like, how do you, language is, is so vast and how do you, how do you yeah. find the right, um, you know, the right words? To... I think sometimes it helps for you to be guided to it. So what I, what I can do is I can send out to, to Brian, I built a sketch note resource PDF for teachers, but what's, it's basically it's uh, collections from the book. And what's nice about it is the PDF has these very much like these, these sheets, but they have words and then they do have to draw. So what you could do is you could get that PDF printed out and then challenge yourself to draw icons for each one of those. And I think the other thing that can help too, um, is if you work in a specific area or you have an area of interest is to make a list of words mm. of the area of interest because those are the things you're going to be sketch noting the most right so you make that list of words and then you do icons and if you have to go to the noun project and get your ideas and then you build and then that you want to build a collection and then if uh if you've got a notebook that you tend to do your sketch noting in or someplace, maybe, you know, if it's the idea book, we've got this grid right here, you can draw them in, or you could have a sheet of paper that you, you know, shoot in there and you can have it with you and then you can move it from book to book. So that would be the way I would approach the icon library is sort of um, challenge yourself. Another thing that I can suggest is, um, so there's a sketch note army Slack channel. I've been doing those little, um, uploads. Yeah, so Sketchner Army Slack has something called, um, I should check and see what the name of it is, but basically there's a channel there, I think it's 20 second uh, icons or something like that. So every morning somebody comes in and posts a word and you have to sketch it in 20 seconds on a post-it note or a piece of paper and take a picture and then you upload it into the Slack channel into another channel and then you share it with other people. And what's kind of cool is not only are you uploading your stuff, but there's other people that are all doing the same thing. So you can say, oh, that's a really interesting idea. I'm going to steal that. I'm going to steal this one, right? You can get other people's take on the same word and start to build it. So what you could do, um, I didn't think about this. Uh, if you made a list of your words, you could talk to Steve Silbert and say, I want to take the Sketchnote Army 22nd for a week. And then you can post <laughs> the words you need the most and make everybody do the hard work and then steal them. Nice. I like that. Thank you. Steve is always looking for volunteers. So when he needs to take a break or has a vacation, we have like a crew of people that like taking it over for a week and posting their words. So I'm sure he would welcome you. Request. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Martha. Thanks, Martha. Joe, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Hey, Mike, uh, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> yeah, nice um, I've enjoyed, uh, I've enjoyed this. And I was watching when you were drawing and I started to panic 
when when I was thinking about the space, I was like, for myself, I would go, oh my God, you got to go to the next page. What's he going to do? And that's, and you did that at the point where he, uh, Brian was talking about uh, the movie mode. Um, and that was early in. And I was like, oh, how's he going to make this work? And then I was just fascinated how you got everything else to work in there. Um, and anyway, the, the question, I don't even know if I have a, a question, an answer, if there's an answer for this. Um, watching you uh, make a decision as to what to keep and what not to put in. I take notes mm. and when I start drawing, I get so frustrated mm. because I put too much detail in and then I get behind and it just becomes like, oh no, what am I going to do now? Um, and so my, my uh, area that I'm working on is trying to limit how to limit the amount of information I'm trying to capture. So the thing I would suggest there is something that I call, um, well, you're already doing caching, right? You're caching ideas. Yeah. But the, uh, so that's just, you know, storing until you're ready. The second one that I find really helpful is staking. And the way I look at that is like, um, I sort of like, it's almost like putting a stake in the ground. Um, and basically I sort of, start something and then I leave enough space to come back and finish it later, which would actually solve the problem maybe of the drawing part of it. So like, let's say, oh, I don't know, you want to do a drawing of a taco. Well, maybe you would just do this, right? And then you would leave enough space around, you know, you have your text here and you keep on going. So then after when you're done, you can say, all right, taco, well, I'm going to finish this. I got to put the meat in. I'm going to put the little thing. Maybe I've got some stuff coming out. Maybe I want to put the shadow. So you're sort of deferring all the detail till after, right? Mm -hmm. And you can do yep. the same thing with words too. What I do a lot of times is like, um, let's say, what I want, what would I say? Let's say um, Ryan was saying marshmallow challenge, but I didn't have time. So my stake would be, maybe I know I'm gonna do two lines. So I would do, uh, instead of the whole word, I would do marsh like this. Right, and then I would say marshmallow challenge. So I'm gonna need about this much space, right? I'm, that's what I'm doing in my head. And then I would just keep on going, write some stuff. And, and at the end I would come back in and when I'm, when I'm more relaxed, come in here and then fill in the detail. Maybe I decide then, I'm not gonna do all capitals. I'm gonna, it sort of gives me some freedom. Like I might come back and the style I'm developing is maybe it's a, bold and then there's script like this, right? So now I can come back and do that. It's, it's sort of like this deferment. So you're deferring something to later. Mm -hmm. So you don't get overwhelmed. So you can just skip ahead to the next thing and keep moving. And you can just keep on doing this staking all the way down the page. Mm -hmm. It probably just helps to make sure you come back right away and, you know, fill that stuff in because the longer you go from the heat of the moment, the more likely you're going to miss something. And the other thing that can be helpful too is if you have a friendly speaker that you know you can approach, you could fill the stuff in and then approach the speaker and say, hey, oh, you were talking about this. Can you talk a little bit more about that or verify something? It gives you the freedom to add some detail. So if you hadn't filled out this section, you could go back and, and talk and then fill it out afterwards. So it gives you a little bit of flexibility when you do it that way. Kyle, find... if you're next. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. No, that was you. Go ahead, Kyle. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you find that um, the the more organized a speaker is in in creating a good outline, the the easier it is to draw? If you have somebody that's just shotgun all over the place, does it make it more difficult to organize your page? Oh yeah, definitely. And I can. Um... I point to our pastor. Our pastor is super organized. Like he has a structure that he, um, he works really hard to get his structure super tight. I know he spends a lot of time on it. He really boils things down. He's sort of like, he's like the chef that really knows how to do a reduction, right? So if you do a reduction right in food, like that, that can make or break a dish. And he puts the time in to get that reduction right. So when he delivers his stuff, it's really powerful uh, the way he presents it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've definitely, um, I've sort of gotten spoiled, honestly, because he's so good at the structure. 
that when I go to someone who's sort of all over the place, like maybe he goes on vacation, like I have to reset, I have to work a lot harder to kind of rein in all the information that's coming at me. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, I've gotten used to, because mostly he preaches, right? So when someone comes in visiting and they don't follow that real tight structure, it sort of puts me in a position where I've got to work a lot harder and maybe come back and, you know, if, it's more of a burden. And if you think about it, um, you're ch- if someone is a speaker and they haven't put that time in to really tighten up their message, it's hard for you as, as a sketch noter, but it's also hard for a listener, right? If they've got to yeah, work really hard. No, it is. Yeah. So, I mean, it, um, it really, one thing I've said is you find out who really good speakers are when you start sketch noting. Like Steve Jobs' Stanford address is like one of the best talks I've ever heard. Like I, and I've heard that thing like a hundred times because I use it all the time for basic, real basic sketch noting. And the more I hear it, the more impressed I am with the hard work that he did to really tighten that story. He's, he brought it down to three real main points. He uses super visual language. So in your mind, you cannot help but think about what he's describing in your head. Like he's painting a picture in your head and you can't stop it. It's amazing. So if you haven't seen the Steve Jobs uh, Stanford talk, that's definitely one to check out. Is that on YouTube? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, Stanford, I think, has a page that has um, the uh, YouTube video, and then below it has a transcript. So if you feel like reading the text, it's available too. And there's a bunch of them. Sir Ken Robinson, who just recently passed away, has a really great one about how education is sort of squeezing this creativity out of school. And it's another one that I really like. It's um, Gaver Tully's um, Five Dangerous Things You Should Teach Your Children, which is really funny. Um, so there's a, there's a bunch of them. I probably wouldn't be a bad idea to make a list of like the best videos for sketch noters, like, or, you know, beginning sketch noters. So you would have something real easy, like, you know, playing softball, where it's so easy because the speaker did such a great job that you can just focus on practicing. And also when you're doing um, something that's a little, uh, who is it? Uh, I think her last name is Brown um, on vulnerability and you're dealing with more conceptual and less uh, metaphor. Right. Yeah. In in that case, it would be more words. Yeah. I mean, you can always fall back on words. Uh, A lot of what I also teach um, new sketch owners, if they're really uncomfortable is if they had a page. So I think about, we talked about progression before. So maybe like for the first, the early sketch noter, maybe the maybe they still write all this text here, right? Maybe this is the title. And then there's little images they draw along here. That's step one. And then in step two, okay, now we're gonna do, um, let's do more like 50-50. So you can write words on this side, you get a title, and then you have a little bit bigger images. And then maybe the next level, Level three, this is where you challenge yourself to go the full width and then you're sort of integrating the images in there, right? So it's a little bit of a slow progression towards this full experience. It's a little bit easier. It's like, you know, the frog in the hot water, yeah. but in a, in a good way, I guess. With a lobster well, uh, yeah, I'm a caricature artist. So my problem is when I've been sketch noting um, I'm not using enough words. I'm I'm doing I'm doing more pictures. And I think that I would say also that um, I talked a little bit about um, you know a few images and lots of words is almost like you know Brian talked about two sides. So on the other end is the maybe more what you're doing with a drawing with annotations, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you think about that on two ends of the spectrum. Um, I almost think like, you know, this would be like your board meeting, right? It's really important that you get details because you're voting on stuff and you got to have a record maybe. And maybe you could do some little drawings here and there. And then on this end is maybe like a TED talk where they're using metaphor and, you know, but I think everything else is going to be somewhere in some marker in between, right? Maybe it's this one. So you sort of, you have to feel free to kind of move back and forth based on the content. That's something to learn too, is like, what is the content that I'm capturing? It's really detailed. Maybe I'm over on this left side on the, on the board meeting side. 
But if it's conceptual, then I can go over to TED Talk. I mean, maybe this is a comfort. Maybe you have to push yourself back in this direction and see how do I how do I manage that? It sounds like that's that's kind of what you're trying to do. So Mike, I've got a question for you, if that's all right, related to the whole idea of where does it fall on the, and it sounds like you tend to go a little bit more detailed if it's highly technical. Um, I think it, it's, I think when you get started sketch noting or graphic recording, uh, the easiest thing to do is to draw what you can draw. Mm -hmm. um, and so somebody says something, it's like, okay, there's a, there's a visual there, I can draw that. Um, uh, I, I've seen a couple of things where people will do these amazing visuals uh, and, but they may miss the point. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I was going back and looking at my own, own charts and I saw that I had drawn, uh, somebody had said, it's like a chess game. So I got real excited because I can draw a chess mm -hmm. set. Right. But I never said what was like the chess set. Uh -huh. right? So it sort of missed the point. So as you are getting into the heads of your, uh, your clients of the people that you're, uh, you're sketch noting for, how do you get to that level of discernment to say, okay, this is beyond just something that I can draw. How do you get to the point of knowing what is most important to capture? That's, that's a, that's probably the toughest thing. And I think a lot of it is sort of a delayed reaction. I guess that goes back to, we talked about caching. So it's like, it's like letting the sieve really fill up <laughs> before you decide what you're going to actually produce. So you just gotta let that let that sieve fill up, and then you know, you're turning on it and thinking about it, and then you're producing. Out of all those things, you're making a decision. So one thing I um, was interesting when when I did the books, um, I recorded a session where someone was talking about um, drumming, this experience drumming, and you can I think the video we it's on my website, you can watch it. And the comment I kept hearing more over and over was, well. Mike's not drawing anything. He's been talking for a long time, but Mike's not drawing anything. And it's sort of like, I think I'm putting a lot of emphasis here on uh, analysis and that's easier said than done. It's tough. And I think it depends again on the scale, um, depending on if it's down at this end, it could be really tough to kind of do that. <coughs> and I think the, the other thing is sort of the balance, right? So in the case where you had the chess thing, Maybe you would have been better off saying, oh, the chess board, I know how to try to draw a chess board. I'm going to just draw the board and say um, uh, chess board is like whatever it is, right? You are, And then you would just leave it just like that. You would keep moving along down your page. And then at the end, so you would almost like, I think of it almost like you'd save it up as a present to yourself. Like, oh, man, I can't wait to draw the chess board, but I'm going to make that a present. But I can't do it until I'm done. So it's like you know, the little carrot that's dangling over, you know, that you're waiting for. So when you get to the bottom and you're done, then you would come back and then, okay, now I can fill in and draw all my chest pieces. And it's like, if you know that about yourself, that you have a tendency to fall down the detail hole, that maybe you actually protect yourself by not letting you, yourself do the detail until later, if that makes sense. Unless there's some, like if you're up in front and like, I guess you could probably, you know, do one piece like the queen or something. I don't know, I don't know anything about chess, so I'm kind of a chess player. <laughs> but, you know, you would draw something there, right, that would represent it. And that's my, that's again coming back to my stake in the ground, right? I'm putting the stake in the ground, but then I come back to it and then I fill in the details if I want to, right? Then I can put the board in and the pieces and there's a guy over here and a guy over there, like whatever that was that you sort of, if you know you have a tendency to draw too much and forget about the text, then you sort of protect yourself. It's a little bit the way I, um, I try my best to avoid um, spelling mistakes. I have my phone out here and I'll test words if I think, oh, that's one of my bad words. I got to take that one, receive. I didn't think I wrote receive here somewhere. I had to think about receive, right? So I tried as much as I can to protect myself um, from making mistakes that way. Um, so, a lot of it is like knowing yourself and knowing what you have a tendency to do and then sort of uh, putting guardrails around those things so you don't get yourself into a bind, if that makes sense. It does, thanks. Kyle, did you have something? Oh, no, I just had Mike. Oh, look at that. So. Here's Kyle. 
here. Oh yeah, you did a caricature, all right. That is awesome. See, that was my kind of, I was sketchnoting before I was sketchnoting. Yeah. Um, I would go to my asso humor association and they'd ask me to draw the keynoter. And so as I'm drawing the keynoter's caricature, I started putting in, of course, what they were talking about. Yeah. But I didn't know there was such a thing as recording. So the main yeah. feature really was getting their yeah. image yeah. on the page. It wasn't yeah. about um, really making sense of what they were saying other than to mm -hmm. just put in a few visuals of what they were talking mm -hmm. about. So maybe it seems like you're a really good candidate maybe uh, for the radio where you put the speaker at the center. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you just make it a little bit smaller so you have more room for the text and then it forces you to fill that space, right? And yeah. then you sort of put in comments and that's kind of cool because you always have that centering, anchoring thing, which is the caricature. And then around the edges, you've got all the things that were said that sort of form that person in a way. And it's cool if you want to give it to the keynoter yeah. as a gift or something, but you know, the, the face of the keynoter isn't relevant to somebody who's trying to remember the keynoter's content. Yeah. So for me, the graphic recording is a lot more exciting because it's more cerebral. It, 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 you have to follow and you're actually learning because you get to listen to these great speakers and you're, you're trying to condense what they are saying in and simplify it much mm -hmm. like a caricature is trying to simplify the features of the face yeah. you're trying to simplify the features mm -hmm. of their uh th their context and i think the context is so much more important it just gives it more emphasis if you can add that that carrot that you just added or the present because it it just makes your memory pop with what the content was Maybe for you, the challenge, like with Brian, is you, the detail is later, like you put in the outline of the caricature that you know you're going to do. And then you sort of force yourself to come up and like you even maybe you make it smaller, right? Yeah, I need to go right. smaller with the caricature. Right. So then now you've got all this white space. Now I've got it like, it's kind of fun to put yourself in a position where you got to do something, right? So by making your caric caricature smaller and limited, like now you got to fill the space. And then at the end, then you get, oh, I get to finish my caricature the way I want and you can. And actually what's really interesting is if you're collecting all this information about what they say, it may actually inform like a little pin that they're wearing or that maybe they're, you were thinking, I'm gonna put them in a suit, but maybe you actually put them in a t-shirt or like the things they say could actually influence the caricature that you're doing, right? That's- Yeah, well, you, you have to think outside the box. Like they don't have to be wearing what they're wearing. They mm -hmm. can be underwater. They can be riding right. a dinosaur. They can be, you know, and, and, and thinking totally, you know, if they're riding a dinosaur or maybe the dinosaur is riding them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> thinking in scale. Wearing a dinosaur suit. <laughs> yeah, when you start thinking in scale, and that's the same thing with typography. I think if you're yeah. thinking in scale, um, your scale will give emphasis to the words and the content. If you find you have to go back, you can accent it with color or bolding it. Um, hmm. It could be interesting for you, like if you know that about yourself, maybe you actually build a template for yourself for the ideal size of the caricature versus the text. Right. And maybe, maybe you even build in, like, like what Brian was showing, it's actually built out, like maybe there's columns for the text. Let's just say you have three columns, your caricature is going to go here and it's going to break across these two. And then you have the bottom and you have enough space, like so then you got to fill in this this stuff here and then here's your person you have some room on either side it of doesn't have to be a person couldn't it be something that you you know say if the content is about the topic uh, yeah. motorcycles or cars or something Submarines like that to, to have a feature icon right. to to put into the context what if it's teaching it might be an apple with a worm coming out of it you know the yeah. classic here's the gift uh and then have that anchor image that you know how to draw, that you're really comfortable with drawing, and then yeah, fill in true. around it. Yeah. A and little maybe, bird told me, you know, maybe yeah. your signature image would be a bird or your signature image might be something. Maybe you structure yourself a thing where it's maybe, I'm just assuming three columns. And then you've got some options. So you could put the 
symbol in the middle and work around it. You could put it at the bottom and work above it. You can work it above and work this way. You can oh, even move it over to this side and then you've got all this stuff. Like you could like, maybe it's more of a grid, right? And then you just lay your sheet on top of it and decide, um, I'm gonna put the, the way this, okay, this is a submarine. I'm gonna need two blocks, right? So I'm gonna put the submarine here and take two blocks up. And then there's maybe a, a little caption here and then text around it or something. So it gives you some flexibility, and then, but it sort of forces you to stay within constraints of some kind. And right. then you sort of build this pattern of like, oh, I really like how that worked out. And you take note and you tweak your pattern so that when you go to the next one, you just sort of have a structure that you follow that you know is going to work. And it puts you in a really good position just to focus on the content, which is really where you want to be. Yeah. You don't want to be uh, whipping up layouts on the fly if you can't help it. Kyle, would you mind showing that one more time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Okay, hold it just for a second. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Cool. I think we've got time for like one quick question. Is there anything out there that is still hanging? Jennifer. I have one one quick question with popcorn and I don't know if you can see this, but like the bottom of my thing is all popcorn. Yeah. And is there a good way to make that cleaner? I mean, I feel like every time I do popcorn, I try and create little containers or little separations or yeah. something, but it always just looks super messy to me. I've never been a fan of popcorn. I saw it being used a little bit. So um, I think sort of the, the charm of popcorn is that it's out of control. <laughs> okay. So maybe what you're looking for is more of a modular structure, but maybe it's just got more components. If that's frustrating you, like it, like I, I usually don't do popcorn because it drives me nuts. I'm too, or, I, I tend to be too organized. So mm -hmm. it just drives me crazy. But I did notice that it popped up with some people that really liked it. So I wanted to respect that it existed and it was an option. But maybe okay. what you're looking for is, uh, maybe it's path, right? So there's, lots of stops along the way, or maybe it's a modular structure with lots of modules. That could be a way to approach it. Thank you for asking that. Sure. Okay, thanks. And we are just about at time. Let's show Mark some Nova Scribes appreciation. We do snaps, so yay, or jazz hands, whatever you want to do. We do a little bit of both. Mike, this was amazing. Thank you so much for taking your time with us. Awesome. We're gonna record the video, get it out there. Hermika's showing hers off. <laughs> so cool guys this this was great mike thank you thank you thank you so much it was you're awesome. welcome and i'll take thank you i'll send that to you guys and thanks a lot thanks everybody good job everyone see you Appreciate next time it. thanks guys mm -hmm.